Okay, William. Um, today is February 13th, 2004, and we're here today with William Burt. Mm -hmm. He's from Phoenix. Right. And he grew up in the Okima neighborhood in South Phoenix. And uh, this is Gene Reynolds, and we're going to interview William today about his memories of his grandfather, who was a labor contractor, and he would bring people from the South Phoenix area um, into Chandler to pick cotton and to work in the fields. So we're going to have him talk a little bit about his memories of that. Um, let's start out a little bit with your your family history. Tell me about um, tell me the names of your of your grandparents, uh, where they came from, and how did they get to the Phoenix area. Uh, my grandparent, my grandfather's name was uh, Edgar Davis, and uh, everybody in here and there in Phoenix or uh, around knew him by Ed, Ed Davis, and his wife was Classy May uh, Davis. Uh, he came to, he moved his whole family from Phoenix, uh, from uh, Arkansas to Scottsdale, Arizona, where he lived on a ranch out there. He did a lot of ranch work uh, from 1941 to 1946. He, 1946, he moved to Okima, which is in the South Phoenix area. When he got there, now he was already uh, working for the, uh, the family out in, in uh, Scottsdale, was, which was called the All Good Family. And he owned a lot of cotton, a lot of uh, hay and grain, and my grandfather did all the work for him. And when he came to Okima, he continued that. I guess all good must have knew other farmers, which contacted my grandfather to do contracting work for them. And I think some of the ones was from the Chandler area. And he contracted the cotton. Uh, he also did uh, uh, haul hay, grain, and bag potatoes. And, and one of the other things was he did was when it comes, you know, during the cotton season, they chopped cotton. They had to weed cotton. And he had people to do that. And he did that, you know, for years. And from, from in 1941, when he first came to Scottsdale, you know, we, Scottsdale was just a small place, just like all the other places were. But he had a large farm out there, so. You know, he did all the work there, and then plus when he had his family with him, he had his son, Tom Davis. He also worked with him on that farm also. They had also had a dairy to milk cows, and this is where he got mainly from his start, is in Scottsdale. Okay. Now, um, when he was in, living in Okima, and um, he was working as a contractor, mm -hmm. um, who were the people that he would hire who are some of the people that he would hire to bring out to work in the fields? Well, most of the people that he had in Okima were Okima. There were, because the people there, you know, were doing the uh, segregation and stuff, they didn't, he couldn't get jobs, so that's where he, he had all his people from Okima, plus his family, and other, other little areas which are not in Okima, but surrounding areas, which is not that far. But that's where most of his people came from, right there in Okima. And Do you some of the families that well, we had say, let's say James, Jim, Jim, the Boozer families. We had the uh, a white family by the name of White. We had uh, uh, the Reeds, and these was all people in in Okima. Now he had other people would come to the fields. They knew where you know they were following him. He would have a truck. You know we put the people in the truck and people would follow that truck out to the fields. And he had a lot of people, nobody, we never did know. And see, he didn't necessarily hire people. People just came, because that was, that was their living, picking cotton. Okay. Why don't you um, tell us a little bit about Okima, where it's located and how it got started? Well, Okima really got started from we had, you know, I did the history on it. Now, people came from Okima, Oklahoma. There's a, there's a, there's a place in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma named Okima. And the people came from there just doing the same thing. They was in search, in search of cotton. And they moved to Okima, but no, they hadn't named it yet. So enough people came and somebody decided we need to name this community. And that was, they named it after this old, old chief in, uh, in uh, Okima, Oklahoma, so they named it after him. 
And that's how it's got its name, because nobody really knew until I started to, doing the research on it. But that's how it's got its name. It's located actually between the Salt River on the north and 48th Street on the east and South Mountains on the south and 7th Avenue to the west. That's, that was, that was the, the, the area which was known then as uh, the Bartlett Herd Ranch. That, that whole area was the ranch, but Okima was just to the Salt River, to, to uh, Roosevelt, to 48th Street. That was Okima. Mm -hmm. So it's just a little small, kind of a small community. Right, just a little small black community is all it was. And that's all that lived there. Okay. And everybody there, if they didn't have jobs, they picked cotton to work in the fields. When your grandfather Ed was working as a contractor, mm -hmm. do you know how he would, you know, establish contracts with different farmers? Well, all he would do they would, they would they would pay him so much, you know, to to a bale. You know, that's that's when they pick cotton on the hay. They they have a bale, and you know, I don't know how much they weigh, but that's what they went by, and and he would pay the workers three cents a pound. To pick for you know, every pound they pick, they get three cents. And that's how uh, he paid, how they got paid. And my grandfather got paid by the bail. You know, I, don't, I, I think a, probably a bail probably weighed a probably eight, nine hundred pounds, probably. You know, we never didn't know what it weighed, but that's how he got paid, and the workers got paid by three cents a, a pound. So the farmers would pay him first, and then right, whenever they. They fill up a trailer, then he would take it to the gin and weigh it, and then and what he make, then he come out there. I don't know how he, uh, how he actually, how, when my grandfather really got got the money for it, but he always had it when he come to the field because he had to have money to pay the pay the workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, where did your grandfather take people to work at? Like which areas? Well, he went. He had people. We had. He, most of the people was from South Phoenix. He had a few he would get from the west side of Phoenix. But most of them was in the Phoenix area. But there would be a lot of people, the word of mouth. You know, he knew a lot of people. So they, in turn, would tell somebody, well, Ed is picking cotton here. Or they would have a place where they, where they would pick people up. He would take this truck or bus over to a certain area, and, and the people would be there. And they'd pick them up. Now where did he where did he take the workers to go work at? Well, he would take them here. Like I said, if he had if he had fields here in Chandler, he went to Chandler, Queen Creek, uh, he even went as far as Buckeye, Arizona. But most of his 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 work was mostly over here in the Chandler area and the Queen Creek area. You know, he had a few fields in the Phoenix area, also, because they had some fields that was close to Okima, you know, in that area. Uh, occasionally, when he, when I was real small, he went out. He he contracted. Took, he would take people out to uh, Eloy. They had they cut they picked cotton in Eloy, and he they had cotton. What they, how, they had cotton camps. He would pick up the people here, take them out to out there, and they would live in these little <clears throat> excuse me, live in those small houses out there, during the cotton picking time. And then he, when that's over, he bring them back. Why don't you? Um Describe for us what it was like to pick cotton. Like what, what, what did that entail? Can you describe that. Well, it mostly tell you just it's just getting up early in the morning, going out there. It's it's, it's you know in the early morning it'd be cold, uh, you know, and you 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 with your bare hands, you know, them bows. You you get your hands all chewed up because you're trying to pick the cotton. And sometimes it's wet. Uh, it's back-breaking work. You have to be bent over all the time. And if you're going to make any money, you had to really know what you're doing. You had to pick fast, uh, have a long sack. And during my time, I couldn't stand a long sack, so I tied it up, make it short so I can fill it quicker. You know, that was, that's what I did. I, was, I never was a real cotton picker. I mostly went out there to, because of the, from my grandmother, you know, she'd feed us. But 
it, for kids, it, it was fun because you would meet other kids out there, you know, and you'd be playing, and, and, and you know, my grandfather would get mad at us, you know, you either make us quit because we mess up the man's cotton. You know, we wouldn't pick it clean like you're supposed to pick it. We'd just be playing in it. But yes, it is. It was it's back baking work, but that was what people had to live on, so they didn't think nothing of it at that time. Mm -mm. But it, 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 it was, uh, but it, it, it was, it was hard work. My, some people had full-time jobs. You know, they worked nights, and they would go out there and pick cotton during the day. You know, but they would could really pick cotton. Those people was making three and 400 pounds of cotton today. See, that's a lot of cotton. You know, 100 pounds was too much for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if they were able to, so if they paid, paid three cents a pound, mm -hmm. right? So if you were a pretty fast cotton picker, mm -hmm. how much do you think you could make in a day? Well, they could make it easily. Uh, uh, you know, when if you made if you made fifteen or twenty dollars a day, you was you was doing good. And that's what a lot of because most people if they go out there doing it for a living. They they pick three to four hundred pounds of cotton. You know, it was 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 of course that that was back then. That was still that was considered a good a good a good wage, you know, but you had to work for it. So that's that was what most of the, the average person I think that went out there, he's going. You you can expect him to pick at least at least three hundred pounds. You know, a good cotton picker. At least that. Now, what when when uh, when people were out working in the fields, if they had to use the bathroom or they wanted to take a break, you know. How did that work? Well, you didn't have you didn't have the outhouses out there. You just had to go back down there in the unpicked areas and use the restroom back there. That was it. You didn't have any restrooms, nothing like that. Only thing that uh, my grandfather provided was the water. They had plenty of water, but anything else, you know, my grandmother she she was she she provided the uh, lunch. That's that's that was her job. She 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 she. she she would have all the lunches, hot lunches for them. You know, when they get, she get out, she get out in the field about ten o'clock and get ready for lunch. But no restrooms. What? What is? Do you remember what she would make for lunch? Yeah, she would have. She she would have mostly sandwiches. You know, different kinds of sandwiches. She would make those. She would cook those. Her fried pies. That's what a lot of people like. She would make chili, and they had the uh, cold drinks for them. And. She would buy, every once in a while, she would buy some fruit and bring out there. But mostly it was sandwiches. You know, she had uh, uh, what they called the pressed ham back then, and tuna sandwiches, and chicken sandwiches, tuna salad sandwiches. Those was about the main things she would bring out there. But everybody looked for the fried pies. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so describe to me what the fried pie is. Well, fried pie is, uh, is, is you, you just make a, a round dough and then you bake it, you know, to brown it. Then you, you fill it with apples or whichever fruit you want to put in it and you fold it over and, and mash it. And that's, that's the fried pie. Where they fry it, you know, you have a little oil that they use, or lard or whatever they call it. So instead of baking it, it would be fried. Right. And everybody loved those fried pies. That sounds good. Yeah, well, they were. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Now, did the workers, um, did, did they buy lunch from her? Is oh, yeah. Work? Yeah, they had to buy. She had a little, either 25 cents or for a sandwich or something like that. And, oh, yeah, they, they would, they was in lunchtime come. They'd come up to the, you know, in the truck. She would be in the truck. Or when later on, he got a bus, and she would do all the stuff in the bus. People would come up and buy their lunch and either sit in the bus. A lot of time, they'd just go sit underneath the trailer and eat lunch or under the truck or something because there was no shade out there. So that's where you had to eat, either under under a truck or under the cotton trailer or, or wherever, if there's a, sometime there's a tree around or in a car or something like that. Now, what time of year were they harvesting the cotton? Well, usually it's being in, because school be unstarted, so it usually just runs around sometime in August and September they start to start the cotton. So that's the, the cool times. And it would go, I think it would probably go up until probably around close to, uh, in December, I think it's just about done. 
and then he'll, he'll, he'll go into some other season which what something else grows if it's if it's uh, if it's potatoes or or some time of chopping cotton he just he just year round he was doing stuff year round mm -hmm. so he would bring those workers out when there were other crops that were ready to be harvested right. and take them out mm -hmm. or either if it's if it's if it's nothing else he'd go into hauling watermelons or grain or whatever he was always he had always busy he kind of kept his fingers into everything. He oh, yeah. knew what was going on and where he could get some work. Right. Everybody, everybody knew Ed, and most, and most of the majority of the farmers knew him, and he, and then he, they just kept him going. You know, and he got his son, and his son was doing the same thing too, contracting cotton, hauling. So they both of them were doing the same thing. Were there ever any uh, farmers that he talked about as, you know? stood out in his mind or anything like that? The only one that I know of was, was, was all good because he lived with, on his place for those many years. Now those he, he you know, that one he always, I, that I can remember him ever mentioning. You know, I never heard him say anything about anybody else. But him, you know, I guess because he lived there, so he talked about him, you know, the same way with his son, you know, because they both, you know, even all good son, he, when he, he had a farm, but I don't remember just where his were. Now, his could have been out here in Chandler. And so they did all of his work too. So, he did, but that was the only one that I could think of that really stood out to him. Okay. <clears throat> um, when, when they're out working in the fields, did, uh, do the women ever do different kinds of jobs than the men would do? No, they did the same thing, men. Except when they when they filled a sack up, they would, if there's a younger person there, she would pay him, uh, pay him a quarter to take her sack to the scale, so she can weigh it and dump it in the trailer. Because it'd be pretty heavy by that time. Oh yeah, she, some of those women they they picks two and three hundred pounds too. You know, because that was a living for them too. But that, that's the only difference is, uh, you know, it would just get somebody. And you have some women take their own bags up there. They don't want to pay that quarter, you know. But uh, they pick just as much as the men, just about. So what's the, what's the youngest age, do you think, of kids that were, that were working in the field? Well, they started, you know, some kids, you know, people would take the children out of school to go out and pick cotton to kind of, you know, to make ends meet. You know, I never did. I always went out there on the weekends, you know, and, and picked cotton or on a holiday or something with my grandfather. Uh, I think I, when I was got when I got up into high school, I would sometimes when I get out of school, I would go out there with my aunt. You know, we'd pick a little cotton, 20 pounds or so. That's about it. I just go out there because I just that's with my grandparents, you know. And but uh, I think the most I ever picked was 100 pounds. In a day, and that was <laughs> That's a lot. that was too much. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, when I interviewed the farmer who was living in the in the house that's near Chandler Boulevard and Price Road, mm -hmm. he mentioned uh, that there was a a young lady who was helping to pay the workers. Okay, yes, yeah, May Liza Williams. Uh, that that's all she 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 did. She would go from she you know my grandfather would weigh cotton and, and pay the workers until she got there. She would cause she always brought my grandmother out with the food and stuff. So once she gets there, then she takes over. She does the weighing, does the paying, and keep the books for my granddad. And that was it. And she did that. I think up until he, he, he retired. And she lived in the old Kima community. As a matter of fact, about four or five houses down from him. You know, so she did all of that work for him. And other than that, that that's the only, only, as far as I know, the only somebody that I know, but most of the contractors, usually their wives always go out with them and do this kind of stuff. Because he's always busy packing trailers, because he had to pack the trailer so he can get more cotton in it for him to make more money out of it. But usually the wives, you know, if they didn't, if they had, didn't have children, the older children take care of the smaller children. She always out there with them doing that kind of stuff. You know, selling sandwiches and stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, another thing that I was kind of interested in was um, whether there were groups of 
people from different racial backgrounds that were working together in the fields? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we had, now he had a several, several people that came up from Mexico. They just came up here and stayed during the cotton season and they go back to Mexico. Uh, there was a couple of white families that lived in Okima that went out. So they, they, they all, it was intermixing. And we had people, like I said, people would drive to the fields in, in all races. They would drive out to pick cotton. So it was no, no problem as far as that goes. Everybody was poor, you know, and they just, just, just like any, just worked together. Well, that was about the way it went, you know, from, 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 you know, from what I saw. You know, I, I, I worked because we went to school with some of them, you know, and, and it was if, if that's what really happened. A lot of people, a lot of people came from Arkansas, too. They come right to, 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 to my grandfather. You know, they knew him, so he, he provided all, a lot of the work that Okima had, you know, because there was nothing else for nobody to do, just, just Okima. How long did your father work as a contractor for? Well, he, like I said, he started out in 1940, really in 1946, when he came, when he moved to Okemo, he built his house there. And when he came there, he went from 1946 up until either the end of, the, toward the end of the 19, 1959 or 58, probably in the 60s, when that's when the cotton picking machine started. And I think that's about when it all really ended, you know, because I can remember going out there when I got out of uh, past high school and I graduated out of high school in 58. So I think yeah, I was going, taking a trade school and I think I would go out a little bit on it. But so I would say no, no the latest probably about 1960, I would think, somewhere in there. So he contracted from that, from 1946 through that. That's so, a long time. Yeah, it was. And you probably saw a lot of changes happen in the area, too. Yeah, oh, yeah, he did. You know, compared to what, you know, I, I, well, I saw the same changes, too, coming up around there, because I grew up there, too, because that's when I first got to Okemos in 1946, too. So I've seen the same things grow up. How old were you when you, when you, when you came to Okemos? I, I was probably, let me see, uh, I, I think five, almost six when I came, because I know we left Arkansas, I was about five, and we wasn't out there in Scottsdale, no, not probably a year, if any. So I would say about, about six years old. And Ed Davis was your mother's father. Right. Mm -hmm. um, from your perspective, what do you think the connection between Phoenix and Chandler was back when your family was working in the fields? Well, I think the only thing for us connected them that I can think of would probably be would be uh, either all good son because I'm thinking he lived here in Chandler, and like I said, a lot of the farmers knew my granddad, and you know if they had had work out here, they would call him up at home, you know, and and they always had somehow had had the connection somehow with them. And he would come. Most of, I think, majority of his work were here in Chandler, because I, because I, I was out here with him all the time. And the Phoenix area, he didn't have a whole lot in the Phoenix area. Now Scottsdale was when all good was planting cotton, so he was there too. And I can't remember which farmer was out here in Buckeye, Arizona, when he, he would go out there too. It could be, it could be some of the same farmers that was out here that had land out there that he did the same thing. But those were the two areas between Phoenix and Chandler, I think, was most of his, most of his work. Now, did, when you were doing, you know, like picking cotton here in, Ch in the Chandler area, mm -hmm. um, did you ever meet anybody from Chandler or Tempe or other towns? Well, yeah, he would, some, when he would come through, when he would come through going to the fields here in Chandler, he, or he, he would make a stop. I, I think it was somewhere either around Arizona Avenue it wasn't far off baseline. He would pick people up there and come out here. Now, how they would know about him being there, because a lot of time you would find people that would, uh, you know, they would know these areas where they hang out, I guess, for people to pick them up. But he would pick up a few people there, and then a lot of the people here would drive out to the field. 
You know, they would somehow, they would get the word somehow, but that's how he, a lot of people, because I know I, when I used to go to the fields with him, I would see, I said, I know all these people didn't get in this truck, you know, because they, a lot of people drove out there. You know, they, somehow they would see these trucks, they know they go into a field, sometimes they would just, they would just follow that truck. And they, that's how they did it. But that was the only connection that, you know, as far as the people live here in Chandler, because a, a lot of them, I think, knew that they had cotton fields here. So I think that's how, you know, they must have, I don't know how it got set up, but they always had a place that he would stop mm -hmm. and pick up people. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, one other question, and this goes back to something that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you can describe what you remember about what the Chandler, downtown Chandler area looked like when you would come through. Oh, back then, boy, well, Chandler, I think you could drive, when you when you come to, uh, that I can remember was Baseline and Arizona Avenue was nothing there. I think there was a few fields there. We would turn off onto Avenue, Arizona Avenue and we would probably travel probably, oh, maybe four or five miles and there's nothing. Then you come to Chandler. Then you would drive through Chandler probably about no more than maybe two miles, then you come to that big jet that used to sit up on the stand out there. And after that, it was nothing. So Chandler was just that little stretch. I don't think Chandler was no more than maybe three miles at the most, you know, in that direction. Now, we didn't know how far it went back this way because Arizona Avenue was about, I think, was about the end of Chandler going, going west just about. Did you ever stop? at a store or anything in Chandler? Uh, not in Chandler, he, he never did. He did, I think the only place that I can remember him ever stopping was in Guadalupe. Because he used to come through there, because they would take a road, you know, we would come from Chandler, come down over that way and, and come through that little old store for some reason. But every then he never did come back through this way, but he would go down some street and then come back down to Guadalupe. Do you remember where the store was in Guadalupe? Was it on? It's on. It was. It's on the uh, uh, east side of the street, and it was probably about gets close to the end of Guadalupe, going north. It's a little old store. I just. I think the thing is still there, but I can't remember the name of it. You know, but he would stop there all the time. Did you guys ever drive down uh, Chandler Boulevard at all? No, I don't think. Well, that that I don't think Chandler Boulevard was. Uh, that I can remember I it ever road. went through down there. Because the only way we could get to Chandler back then was if you either had to take Broadway down to Arizona Avenue or uh, Baseline. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if Southern went all the way through it. It may have, but those are the only streets in, in, in Apache Boulevard. Those are the only streets that went, you had to go that far to get over here. Okay. Didn't have any of them. But I was just, like I told you earlier, I said Chandler has really grown now. You know, I've seen stuff down down here that I never dreamed of seeing back then. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, anything you want to ask, Ray? Uh, when you drive through the downtown area, you remember the park? What the park looked like back then? Well, you know, I, when you, I don't, I can't remember if we, if there's, if a park was there because we would get on Arizona Avenue, we wouldn't see much. You didn't, because none of the, all the municipal buildings and things, none of that was there. Nothing. I think where, from baseline, like I said, we had, we went about probably three to four miles before we even hit anything for Chandler. So that would probably put it, well, no, because Chandler didn't, Chandler Boulevard didn't go through then. Because once you hit baseline, there wasn't no other streets coming through here on this side of on the south end of it. Probably the first building you'd see is probably the high school. Yeah, the high school was there, yeah. I remember I remember that. You know, but I, I, I you know, that's the only I think that was that's after we 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 probably be in drove for, for for a while before we got that far. See. And a matter of fact there was uh, fields then. I think there was a lot of hay fields during that time you know, was what they had. See, cotton hadn't, I don't know if cotton was that close down. I think cotton was mostly in this area, back down in this part of it, where all the cotton fields were. 
and the potato fields in the Queen Creek area. I don't know, I don't remember anything about the Gilbert area, but Queen Creek, he did a lot of hauling and stuff over there. And a little cotton too. But I think most of the majority of the cotton was here in Chandler that he did. So that was, it was, it was, uh, but, but, but he made, he made his, his, his living doing it. You know, like I say, he got his son and they had, like I said, those two other pictures of the contractor, those, they were contracting cotton, so they probably was out here too. Because it was a lot of cotton, you know, he couldn't do it all. Yeah. So, but he had, done, that I know of those four contractors was, was we all lived within to a mile of each other. So they all, I don't know if he got them into it or what, but they were all working with him. Mm. What do you remember most about your grandfather and your grandmother? Well, those, those was my grandmother, that was my heart. You know, I, I, I love that because see, she, she, she kind of raised me a little bit when my parents, my parents went to Eloy to pick cotton. So I was going to school, so I stayed with my grandmother. You know, he was down there, but she was there, so I stayed with her. And uh, she, she was just my heart. You know, nothing I wouldn't do for that little lady. And uh, she was crazy about. She had three of us. She was crazy about. And you know, and we stayed with her all the time. You know, I would go by there every morning, going to school to get a biscuit. She would cook those biscuits. I would go by. You know, she would save me a fried pie when she comes from the field. So she, she always did that for me. But that's, you know, I have real fond memories of both of them. You know, my granddad, when the cotton was done, he would cut yards. He was in the lawn business also. So I would cut grass with him, go out there on the weekend or after school or when holidays or when school's out. So he kept us busy. He didn't pay us much, but we, we just go out for the heck of it. Yeah. Yeah, that was Grandpa. I guess I'm following the steps, footsteps. I guess now with is my there, grandkids. Is there yeah? Is there anything that you think that you learned from your, from your grandfather? Well, I a lot work. I, 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 you know, if I'm if I'm doing something, I'm gonna do it. You know, that's that was one thing about him. You know, he didn't run from any work. He whatever they wanted him to do, he did. And he, you know, he didn't take no, you know, he get the people to come out there. If they come out to pick cotton, they gonna come out to pick cotton. If they not, you go home. So he was, he was, he was strict. You know, he didn't want to mess it up because it looked bad for him. So, but he, that I learned from. If you're gonna do a job, do it good. And I've always done that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's grandpa for me. Now, you know, I miss them both, too. I really do. Yeah. yeah, I miss both of them. You know, he passed away in 1988. You know, that's... And my grandmother, she lived, uh, I think, about, oh, five, five, five years longer than he did. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she went blind. You know, I don't know. We, to this day, we don't know why, but my mother also went blind the same way. It was just something, that, you know. I guess like home or whatever it is. So it's, but they were they were they both was they were well they were well liked by everybody, you know. Contractors, you know, they come out there, they treat him, you know, just just nice and, and they just keep him busy because they know that he's going to do him a good job, and that's 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 what I really remember about him. He's going to do him a good job, whatever it is, and he did. You know, he didn't let nobody mess over the man's field, you know. I, he, he, he fired me because I tore up the man's cotton. You know, you know, I didn't know I was trying to learn how to chop cotton, and I was chopping too much of the cotton down, so he, he just, just come out there and got me and said, give me that hoe. So you go up there in, 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 in the wagon and help sell lunches. So uh, I think that was the last time I went out and done chop cotton, last time. Yeah, it was. <clears throat> but he, but like I said, that was the main thing that I remember about him, that he did a good job and I always carried that with him and did the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. We're good.
Thank you. Good. William, I appreciate all those things about my grandparents. Mm -hmm. You know, because I was there all the time. You know, lived with him. You know, and, and uh, saw what he did. Worked with him. But I really, I do miss him. You know, I, you know, going out there in the fields. You know, I, I say I didn't go out there to make no money. That's for sure. You know, I just went out there. But most of the time, you know, people go out there and they, the, the school kids go out there to court. You know, they make a rain at the school and say, man, we're going to pick cotton today. You going? And that's how that, you get a bunch of kids out there on the weekend. Mm -hmm. I talked to one of the, the ladies who went to Chandler High School and she said they used to pull them out of class. Yeah, they did. I tried to do that too one time, but he knew better. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of guys that lived out there. They went to the principal's office, you know, because he, he knew they didn't have any money and their husband and their father was a, was alcoholic, so they didn't. They had to go out and pick cotton and make lunch money and stuff. You know me, you know, my, my dad, of course, he was working for Reynolds Metals Company. I'm going to go right in there with them, you know. I said, yeah, well, I got to go pick cotton, too, because I need to make lunch money. He said, no, you don't. I said, your dad works, works for, you know what you're working. You get yourself back to class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't let me do that. Cause I wanted to. But I was just getting out of school, that's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm.